I will speak about in light of small things. As you remember the preface of this famous book by Jeff, it was in the shadow of big things. And I, I think we are all the time under the shadow of big things. Nothing changed from that time Jeff was writing that book, but at least we have this path of light illumination uh, around small things. And I want to say a few words. Why is it is so important, so influential into my practical work um, and in the world view? Uh, and what is this connection between Jeff Goldfarb, whom I have met years ago when he visited my town, small town, say in Poland, and at the beginning, at the very beginning, the feeling was that we know each other since all time, and there was kind of brotherhood. What was behind that encounter? the power of this encounter and what happened with the kitchen table which once existed in a communist poland in the 70s and 80s when jeff visited us our country what happened with this kitchen table after 1989 where it is today where is this table uh, I so I think behind our meeting uh, encounter, there are a few important things. One of them is the theater. I, I am a part of Polish alternative theater movement in the 70s and 80s, and maybe not exactly the theater uh, Jeff is writing about in his book, because he's writing mostly about this direct political public theater in the 70s. My story is a little bit after that, when the question for my colleagues and me was do, that doing this anthropological theater based on expeditions to the local communities, first in Poland, then in different corners of the world, you know, Europe, in South America, in Australia, uh, where ancient, ancient cultures still survive, that we didn't have a culture to give back. So it was based on receiving gifts from that communities. They were sharing with us songs, rituals, memories, dances, the most intimate treasures they had. And we were collecting, uh, collecting them, building an avant-garde performances on the basis of that and never came back. Never uh, did we have chance to give back. There was no, so because we ended up on the festivals usually as theater did at, uh, at that time, so, one of the sources of creating the Borderland Center was to stay with people, uh, with the theater, and even in the cost of the theater, because at the beginning we stopped to be a theater group when we uh, ended up in a small town, Borderland town, say in, uh, in Poland. But the major thing was to stay with people and to do something together, to, to listen, to hear, and then to find answers how we can use our craft, artistic craft, theater craft, to transmit the memories, experiences uh, into the art form. So this is about the theater. The second background, I think, is poetry. And uh, the, the person who connects us is Czesław Miłosz, mentioned by Elżbieta before, and, but we, had, we just uh, spoke with Jeff in the lunch break about the long conversation we had together about Miłosz poetry. And why poetry? Because Miłosz was a, a very 
special poet for not only Poland, I think, on, 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 of that part of the world, which disconnected poetry with this romantic, emotional attitude to the poetry, that this is something irrational, you know, messy, which, I mean, the poetry, which try to connect us with uh, uh, spiritual dimension of life and so on. Miłosz, in contrary, was a poet teaching us that the poetry is about the details, the con concrete and the truthfulness of uh, concrete things that you should build your language. The poetry is like building a language which is precise, which is truthful, and will, which is faithful to your inner or social experiences. And not only thinking about poems politically engaged, because he was writing such kind of poems as well, but also concerning spiritual life. The spiritual is based on concrete and truthfulness to reality, in contrary to what we think being, you know, romantic uh, uh, tradition of, uh, of poetry. And I think this is something what uh, Jeff catch uh, from this uh, Miłosz uh, poetry tradition. So I received a letter from Czesław Miłosz, the first letter I, I received from him when we established Borderland Center, it was exactly about that you are doing, uh, you are going to do something after communist time, after 1989, which will be based on concrete and with respect to details, to individual life, to, uh, to the truthfulness, to the reality. So it was like a, to be anti-communist, you know, at that time, it, well, uh, it meant that you are based with your work on something that is individual, concrete, and anti-ideological in any, any way. And the third background for, uh, for us, I think, is Jewishness. I, I don't know if you ever think about the connection between the politics of small things and Jewishness. But I have a friend, uh, he's an Italian writer living in Trieste, Claudio Magris, uh, being himself the borderlander. And once he visited me in Seine and spending a few days you know, looking through our programs, studios and so on, at the end he said, listen, there is something Jewish in your work. But this is not about that you are revitalized the former synagogue or that you publish books about Polish-Jewish relationships or you have a Jewish theme in your performance, but you are Jewish because you believe that in a small town you can build a, small, a center of the world. <laughs> there is something Jewish in, in the politics of small things this belief that the small towns, the small community could be the center of the world, that the libraries they have, the schools, the yeshiva, could be the most ambitious, uh, you know, from the philosophical, theological, uh, cultural point of view. And you don't need to go to big centers to, to fulfill your ambitions. Uh, in any dimension. So this is, I think, also behind our encounter. But now I want to say a few words about the kitchen table. What happened with the kitchen table after 1989? Because as you know from the book, it was a communist time, it was a regime, and people found the shelter, you know, the, the free space, which uh, was impossible to find outside uh, in the public sphere, uh, in a kitchen. Uh, only, only possibility to, to be honest, to, to speak, you know, to each other without hesitation and, uh, and so on. Uh, when it, when uh, Jeff was writing about that, and it, it was a history from the 70s and 80s, 
it was illum illum illuminating for us, I mean, Poles, citizens of Central Eastern Europe at that time, that the person from New York, the person from United States, from the big country, language, culture, respect the small. We did not, although we practice it, but there was no special respect to that. You know, we wanted to be big. We wanted to go out of that limits of that space to something bigger. And I think this is one of the reasons we have problems after 1989 with solidarity with other things, something we lost in the new period of our history because we were not capable to defend small things. And suddenly we heard this voice from the other side of the ocean that it matters, that you should capitalize, you know, and, and, and build something upon that. That was the message I, I've heard from, from Jeff. Yes, I'm now among you here in New School. Yeah, not even having a PhD <laughs> coming from a small town. And I feel at home here. And since many years, I feel at home here. Why? Yeah. How it happened, you know, that you, Elżbieta, Jeff, your teams created this practice of small things that you are respected uh, because of practicing small things, because only uh, uh, contribution I, I can have to this meeting, to other meetings we had, was my, my practice in small things. So I'm part of your policy uh, of, uh, of small things, but it's a big thing to know that you, your small things, your small steps, your small town can matter and can have, you know, the power. And sometimes you need a person from a distant place to make you aware about that. In fact, that was also the role of, of you uh, for us. What happened with this table, uh, the kitchen table? It, this table is not anymore in the kitchen. <laughs> the first thing we were obliged to do, and I remember exactly that moment when I, I, I considered myself that we should go out of the underground, we should go out of the alternative culture to the public, to the center. So we took this table to the public sphere, to the small community, uh, which was not very much ours. You know, we decided with my our colleagues to move to the small town, and we didn't know these people, in fact, and they were never before around this table. So it was not like in the 70s that we knew everybody around that table. There were new people. Uh, not familiar with this kind of culture and being present around the table. But at least there was a call, maybe you can join us, you know, think about this space in the very center of small town, which once was Jewish, now is empty. Maybe we can have a talk. Maybe we can uh, gather to hear you, to hear about your life experience in the 20th centuries, you Lithuanians, you Ukrainians, deported there after Vistula River in 47, you uh, rational believers, you Poles, uh, I'm, you Greek Catholics, you Orthodox, you Protestant. Let's talk, yeah? So the first gathering around this table in a synagogue, in a former synagogue was about that, just, and it was for, for the first time to, to gather the whole multicultural community around one table, taking them from different tables they usually had in their houses, you know, because of the nationality, religion difference, uh, uh, and so on. So to, to make this table slowly common. The second step was 
And of course, uh, not to speak to them, rather to, to keep silence and to let them speak, yeah? To, uh, to learn how to listen. Uh, and even it, when it was silent, or even the person joining the table was somebody you may say nationalist or even anti-Semite or in, uh, with other prejudices, the main thing was not what she or he was saying, but his or her participation around the table, that they do not reject the invitation. In fact, and uh, and that's how the second uh, thing about this table started to be clear for us that it should stay for a long time. That we should stay with them uh, because otherwise there will, the table will not work. You need time. One year, two years, 10 years, now 30 years to keep it working. And don't expect that you will solve anything around this table over one year or any kind of a short event or, or project. Yeah? So we should somehow invent to culture some, the completely new element, the time dimension, that we have time for this, what we want to build around the table. <laughs> The next thing was about the memory. Of course, it was the burden, you know, of the people sitting around the table, different memories, how to work with them. In short, my answer to that uh, today is a critical memory, the common memory and the good memory. The critical means that you are, you are doing self-critical work to be part of the table. So you do, don't talk about your own big victimization, suffering only, but you try to find your own weaknesses, yeah? And be brave enough to talk about them. And don't expect that other will uh, tell about it as well, yeah? Just do it by yourself if you can. And then you go deeply in this critical, you know, you, you have more time. And so finally we publish books like Professor Daniel Bevois about Polish colonial, colonialism uh, under the Ukraine, which was quite a strong, you know, new narrative for Poles, you know, in Poland at that time in the nineties. Then we publish for the first time Jan Gross book about the neighbors, uh, about Polish-Jewish relationships, and so on and so on. So you do this work, and then because of that, you make a room for other people to sit around the table. The third, uh, the second is common memory, which was, which is still, you know, maybe difficult to imagine, but we know that we have different stories, different memories, but can we share the, something in common in uh, our memories? And, and the third one, which is most difficult, uh, in fact, is to give, to allow ourselves or to struggle for dig up a good memory from inside of us, of the community. It's very easy to dig up uh, negative memories, to remember about conflicts and sufferings, but, but how to find the language, legitimate language around this table to share good memories? Or something positive among it's you know the, uh, uh, the, the Daniel was uh, speaking about the gestures in the uh, around the conversation, so there is there was a willingness to do a good gesture towards the others, but how to do it? You know, very often people were saying, "I'm uh, I will be a kind of an idiot." You know, help me how I should do. We have rituals, you know, to do gesture saying how we suffered and to celebrate our you know independence days our, uh, our son but but you know to say something really good about the neighbors was not easy okay so there are a few things like that about about this new table you know in the uh, in the public uh, sphere uh, I wanted to mention, and the last one maybe, it is about 
And it's very much because our table now in Seine is turned to the direction of Ukraine. And uh, the, so we have a, a Ukrainian community now in our town, the, the newcomers from Ukraine. Uh, we even open a Ukrainian house, Zustrich, in our small town to give them the space to be um, uh, at home, you know, with the, uh, to have a space at least. But the discussions we have and the actions we have around the table, uh, they are about, about what's going on with the war in Ukraine and how to cope with that how to be and you see there is something when table works something happens what's what i call the karuna's karuna's blow the karuna is the goddess of compassion in sanskrit but this is a different kind of compassion it is not about compassion about your own suffering or the suffering of your own people karuna is about being awakened facing the suffering of, of the others. So you are awakening as a self, you know, because the others are suffering. And, it, and this is exactly what happens now in, around our tables, that we are awakened, hearing the voices and, uh, and that suffering going on in Ukraine. What it means, it means that this compassion uh, gives you not only the power for be hospitable for people from Ukraine, but to do all other things among them, not to divide the aesthetics from the ethics, not to have a, the, the borderline between beauty and good, that you suddenly under the corona's blow, you feel that it is all united, uh, in fact, around that table. And I think it's one of the major narratives now we have against Putinism, not only Putin's Russia, but the Putinism we have also in Poland or other corners of the world. So the politics of small things for, for us now, it's very much about how to oppose Putinism in, uh, in different parts of the world. And the last quotation I, I have, I want to share with you, it's part of my manifesto, small center of the world, but it is translated by Marcy Shore, but uh, Jeff edited in, in a very masterful way uh, this text, and I want to read you one uh, acapit from that text. An art, specially nurtured in a small center of the world, is an acceptance of gifts. This art speaks to the fact that we are not self-sufficient, Life is a communion, a being together created by the obligation to reciprocate gifts. The world turns to us through gifts. We can choose to not accept them, to not reciprocate. We can choose to exploit them against the intentions which, which they were offered. This gives us a feeling of independence and mastery. But the small center of the world is not the hub of the universe. It is codependent, free precisely through its responsibility for coexistence. A small center of the world exists insofar as others can contribute gifts. Reading this, I want to say thank you to Jeff Golfer, giving us occasion to give to offer the gifts to him. We are so rich now. You know? <laughs> and doing that, he is a center of the world. <laughs> but, <laughs> and, see, and this is so wonderful, Jeff, that when I will add to the center of the world, a small center of the world. I will not <laughs> diminish the value of that. Thank you. So much. <laughs>